The history of slavery is a painful reminder of humanity's capacity for cruelty and oppression. Slavery in America was deeply entrenched from the colonial era through the antebellum period, with enslaved Africans and their descendants subjected to forced labor, physical punishment, and various forms of degradation. The term antebellum derives from Latin where anti means before and bellum means war. In the context of American history, the antebellum era refers to the period before the American Civil War, specifically the years between the late 18th century, which was after the War of 1812, all the way down to the outbreak of the Civil War in 1861. The term antebellum era is commonly used to describe this period because it captures the distinct social, economic, and political characteristics of the time, which ultimately led to the conflict and division that resulted in the Civil War. It was a time of significant growth and transformation in the United States, marked by industrialization, westward expansion, and debates over slavery. Yes, slavery. The antebellum South was characterized by the use of slavery and the culture it fostered. During the procession of this era, Southern intellectuals and leaders gradually shifted from portraying slavery as an embarrassing and temporary system to a defense of slavery as a positive good. And for this, the abolitionist movement which had just come into existence then was harshly criticized by these leaders for being in opposition to slavery. The demand for slave labor and the U.S. ban on importing more slaves from Africa drove up prices for slaves, making it profitable for smaller farms in older settled areas such as Virginia to sell their slaves further south and west. Most farmers in the south had small to medium-sized farms with few slaves, but the large plantation owner's wealth often reflected in the number of slaves they owned, afforded them considerable prestige and political power. During the antebellum era, the nation grappled with issues such as states' rights, the expansion of slavery into new territories, and tensions between the North and the South. These factors contributed to the eventual outbreak of the Civil War, which had a profound and lasting impact on the country. However, while the dehumanization and mistreatment of slaves is well documented, with ample evidence of sexual relations, from rapes to what appears to be relatively symbiotic romantic partnerships between white slave masters and black women in the antebellum South, a lesser known aspect is the abuse endured by black male slaves at the hands of elite white women, that is, the planter class women. Yes, that too occurred. The planter class white women refers to a specific group of women who belong to the elite plantation owning class in the American South of the United States, during the antebellum era. These women were associated with the wealthy plantation owners predominantly focused on cultivating cash crops such as cotton, tobacco, and rice, and relied heavily on slave labor. These wealthy plantation owners were referred to as the planter class, while their wives, who held privileged positions within the social hierarchy of the time, were the planter class white women. However, using an intersectional socio-historical analysis, this very video delves into the often overlooked history of the exploitation and mistreatment faced by black male slaves, exploring the factors that may have contributed to the incidents of sexual encounters between the planter-class white women and slave men, the power dynamics embedded in them, and their implications in terms of sexual consent. The segment further demonstrates how these upper-class white women who engaged in these relationships use sex as an instrument of power, simultaneously perpetuating both white supremacy and patriarchy during this dark era. Before we get right into this proper, kindly hit the like button in front of you, share to keep spreading these eye-opening contents, and subscribe. You just remember that all you have to do is sit back and relax while we unravel before you're viewing today the uncommon story of the planter-class white women and the remarkable abuse black male slaves encountered at their hands. Now let us begin. Intersection of power and gender slavery was not only a system defined by racial subjugation, but also one that reinforced gender hierarchies. While the planter-class white women in the antebellum South were bound by societal expectations of femininity, they still held significant power within the context of slavery. These women played active roles in maintaining and perpetuating the institution. The authority they wielded extended to the management and treatment of enslaved individuals, including black male slaves. White women had the power to issue commands, give instructions, and enforce discipline within their homes and on plantations. It is of great relevance to note that in the American South before the Civil War, white women couldn't vote. They couldn't hold office. When they married, their property technically belonged to their husbands. But there was one thing they could do, 
just as white men could. They could buy, sell, and own enslaved people. In the book, they were her property, White Women as Slave Owners in the American South, authored by Stephanie Jones Rogers. The historian makes the case that white women were far from being passive bystanders in the business of slavery, as previous historians have argued. Rather, they were active participants, shoring up their own economic power through ownership of the enslaved. In the past, historians had often based their conclusions about white women's role in slavery on the writings of a small subset of white Southern women. But Jones Rogers, who happens to be an associate professor of history at the University of California, Berkeley, drew on a different source this time from interviews with formerly enslaved people conducted during the Great Depression as part of the Federal Writers Project, an arm of the Works Progress Administration. These interviews, Jones Rogers writes, show that white girls were trained in slave ownership, discipline, and mastery, sometimes from birth, even being given enslaved people as gifts when they were as young as nine months old. White slaveholding parents train their daughters on how to be slave owners. They give them lessons in slave discipline and slave management. Some even allow for their daughters to mete out physical punishments, Jones Rogers says. Slaveholding parents and slaveholding family members gave girls enslaved people as gifts. For Christmas sometimes, when they turned 16 or when they turned 21. There are even accounts of slaveholding parents and family members giving white female infants enslaved people as their own. There is one particular instance of a case in a court record where a woman talks about how her grandfather gave her an enslaved person as her own when she was merely nine months old. And just how could a nine months old baby have known that she had a slave of her own if she wasn't told so? Apparently, she has been schooled on the ropes. She grew up knowing that some absolute authority over another has been bestowed on her, that she had some waiting property of her own in the form of a human being. Stated a poet and writer on his findings in the book, They Were Her Property by Jones Rogers. Such children grow up not even recognizing black slaves as fellow human beings. These exact nurturings have majorly contributed, no doubt, to the creation of highly racist and supremacist personalities in societies at large. Some deeply faulty mental structure this is, which must be destructured. A mentality that must be visited and revisited to create a new mindset, the kind that would at the end of the day see and regard all as equal. Sexual Exploitation one of the most distressing aspects of the abuse endured by black male slaves at the hands of elite white women was sexual exploitation. Although the dominant narrative often portrays white women as passive or innocent, there were instances where they actively engaged in non-consensual sexual relationships and rape, exploiting their power and control over black male slaves. These actions perpetuated a cycle of sexual violence and degradation, further dehumanizing the already enslaved. Here's one example of such many cases found in the autobiography, Incidents in the Life of a Slave Girl, where the author Harriet Jacobs, who being once a slave, talks about how planters' daughters would take advantage of male slaves. They know that the women slaves are subject to their father's authority in all things, and in some cases they exercise the same authority over the men slaves. I have myself seen the master of such a household whose head was bowed down in shame, for it was known in the neighborhood that his daughter had selected one of the meanest slaves on his plantation to be the father of his first grandchild. She did not make her advances to her equals, nor even to her father's more intelligent servants. She selected the most brutalized, over whom her authority could be exercised with less fear of exposure. The kind of relationship described here by the author is clearly of a sexually predatory behavior. And such an act, as Jacobs confirms, was not uncommon nor can it be classified as consensual in any meaningful sense of the word. It, in fact, constitutes a form of sexual abuse, if not rape. We thus see that plantation mistresses and elite women, like their male counterparts, were able to sexually control and abuse their slaves. Another way in which the planter-class white women were able to exercise sexual control over slaves was by threatening to accuse them of rape or attempted rape if they did not agree to sex. In doing this, Elite white women used one of the primary instruments of patriarchal repression, the idea that they were weak and in need of white male protection, and by extension, in need of control and domination by white men, to exercise racial control over black male slaves. Possible Causes of Sexual Exploitation Why these women chose to sexually abuse slaves probably varied by situation. Perhaps some of them were simply bored or sexually frustrated. But perhaps, at least on a subconscious level, 
sexually exploiting slaves was a means of compensating for their lack of power in other aspects of their lives. Planter-class women were considered the property of their husbands and lacked considerable sexual agency relative to men. It is possible the sexual exploitation of slaves by women who had little power in relation to white men was a source of enjoyment that created a feeling of power. This is not to excuse the actions of sexually abusive white women, nor is it to suggest that female sexual abuse of slave men would not have occurred had women enjoyed a higher status in society. However, just as slave-owning white women often took out their frustrations on slaves through excessive cruelty and violence, they probably also used sex as a means of domination and control in a society in which they were relatively powerless. Their freedom and mobility was severely limited. For example, they were generally not allowed to travel without an older male chaperone. Spousal abuse was often considered a legitimate method for men to control their wives in the antebellum era. Indeed, in private, many plantation women were unhappy with their lack of freedom and the expectation that they remain dutiful, obedient, pleasant, and cheerful while their husbands had affairs with or raped female slaves. Knowing that the mixed, race slave children who surrounded them were their husband's offspring was both humiliating and heartbreaking. Historian Catherine Clinton, 1982, has this to say, if plantation mistresses could live above reproach, their husbands, fathers, sons, and brothers could boast of the superiority of their civilization. She further goes ahead and terms them prisoners in disguise. Southern women, who generally married at a younger age than those in the North, not infrequently at 15 or 16 years old, were often left abandoned on plantations while their husbands traveled for business, pleasure, or military duty. The life of a plantation mistress was often lonely and sad. Physical Abuse By 1830, slavery was primarily located in the South, where it existed in many different forms. African Americans were enslaved on small farms, large plantations, in cities and towns, inside homes, out in the fields, in the industry, and transportation. Though slavery had such a wide variety of faces, the underlying concepts were always the same. Slaves were considered property, and they were property because they were black. Their status as property was enforced by violence, actual or threatened. People, black and white, lived together within these parameters, and their lives together took many forms. Physical violence was not limited to white male slaveholders. White women, too, participated in acts of brutality against black male slaves. These acts ranged from whipping and beating to inflicting other forms of corporal punishment, leaving lasting physical and psychological scars. A good example of the bad, unspeakable lengths to which physical abuse could go on black male and female slaves is the infamous story of none other than Madame Marie Delphine LaLaurie. Madame LaLaurie thrashed her slaves, gauged their eyes out, punched holes in their heads, and left maggots to infest the openings. And if you think this is all some terrible lie or some hoax, then best brace yourself for what you are about to hear concerning this 18th century slave owner, the terrible evil meted out on her slaves. Here's a brief one on Marie Delphine LaLaurie. On April 10, 1834, at the mansion at 1140 Royal Street in the French Quarter of New Orleans, Louisiana, a fire broke out. The neighbors rushed out to help, offering to pour water on the flames and help the family evacuate. However, when they arrived, they noticed something odd by 19th century Southern elite standards. The woman of the house was trying to save her jewels and furs without the aid of her slaves. Madame LaLaurie, the great mistress of the house, alone? A mansion without slaves seemed shocking. When asked where her servants were, she told everyone to mind their own business. Some said this was mysterious enough. Others said they heard faint moans and screams from the attic. Either way, a small brigade took it upon itself to bust into the house and find the woman's slaves. Yet when they opened the door to the attic, they stopped dead in their tracks, some vomiting from the stench. It was impossible to stand the demonic mind-to-stomach twisting grisly sight. It was all there, stark. All the madness that a devil could be. All the ugliness of things miserable that can only be imagined. What the interlopers had found was the torture chamber of Madame Marie Delphine LaLaurie, consistently ranked after this as one of the most infamous serial killers in the world right up there with the blood-drinking, cannibalistic 16th-century Hungarian Countess Elizabeth Bathory. Neighbors had confirmed their suspicions of her. The reason for the disappearance of all LaLaurie slaves was now bare for the world to see. It was savagery. Heaps of corpses, organs, and limbs. Slaves pinned to tables or cramped in small cages. Metal bars with spikes wrapped around the slaves' necks to prevent them from moving their heads, 
while others were placed in small cages and their bones had been dismantled and reset to fit in. Crazy! Live bodies with their eyes gouged, fingernails torn out, ears hanging by shreds of skin, or their mouths filled with feces and sewn shut, many of them, people with flayed skins and festering wounds. Several accounts claim they found one woman whose skin had been peeled off in spirals to make her look like a caterpillar, another with her bones broken and reset so that she looked like a crab, and one more whose intestines had been torn out and knotted around the waist. Many of these victims, some had claimed, were up to a hundred who were supposedly still alive, putrid and starving. No kind of physical abuse has gone to such lengths. LaLaurie became famous for the depraved brutalization of her slaves. Legend has it that a 70-year-old slave cook who had been chained to the stove in the kitchen by LaLaurie, yet was slowly starving to death also, started the fire. While interrogated, the woman had admitted that she started the fire in an attempt to kill herself, then face LaLaurie's torture. Madame LaLaurie had threatened to take her to the top room. No one who went to the upper room ever returned, according to the cook. The lady had decided that it was better to die than suffer at the hands of Madame LaLaurie. Following this discovery, the top chamber was broken into in order to investigate the cook's assertions. And without a doubt, the top room was hell on earth for the slaves who ever ended up there. Born on the 19th day in the month of March, 1787, in the then Spanish-ruled New Orleans as Marie Delphine McCarty, most of LaLaurie's life passed without any real indication of cruelty or evil. Despite the rumors that slaves killed her parents, the mistress actually lived a fairly normal and privileged life. She was a major part of New Orleans high society and beloved as a kind, gentle, and courteous figure. LaLaurie's father was Louis Barthélemy de McCarthy, originally Chevalier de McCarthy, whose father Barthélemy de McCarthy brought the family to New Orleans from Ireland around 1730 during the French colonial period. Her mother was Marie-Jean Lerable, also known as the Widow Le Comte, as her marriage to Louis B. McCarthy was her second husband. Both of Delphine's parents were prominent in the town's European Creole community. Her uncle by marriage, Esteban Rodriguez Miro, was governor of the Spanish-American provinces of Louisiana and Florida during 1785 to 1791, and her cousin, Augustin de McCarty, was mayor of New Orleans from 1815 to 1820. LaLaurie married three times and had five children, whom she was said to attend to lovingly. Her first husband was a Spaniard named Don Ramon de Lopez y Angulo, a Caballero de la Royal de Carlos, a high-ranking Spanish officer. The pair had one child together, a daughter, before his untimely death in Havana, while en route to Madrid. Four years after Don Ramon's death, Delphine remarried, this time to a Frenchman named Jean Blanc. Blanc was a banker, lawyer, and legislator, and was almost as affluent in the community as Delphine's family had been. Together, they had four children, three daughters, and a son. After the death of Jean Blanc, Delphine married her third and final husband, a much younger doctor named Leonard Louis Nicolas LaLaurie. In 1831, Madame LaLaurie purchased a three-story mansion at 1140 Royal Street in the French Quarter. And as many society women did at the time, Madame LaLaurie kept slaves. Accounts of Delphine LaLaurie's treatment of her slaves between 1831 and 1834 are mixed. Harriet Martineau, writing in 1838 and recounting tales told to her by New Orleans residents during her 1836 visit, claimed that slaves of LaLaurie were observed to be singularly haggard and wretched. However, in public appearances, LaLaurie was seen to be generally polite to black people and solicitous of the health of those enslaved. On two occasions, she has been known to emancipate two of her slaves, according to court records, Jean-Louis in 1819 and de Vance in 1832. Funeral registers between 1830 and 1834 document the deaths of 12 slaves at the Royal Street Mansion, although the causes of death were not mentioned. However, public rumors about LaLaurie's mistreatment of slaves on her property had become sufficiently widespread that a local lawyer was dispatched to Royal Street to remind LaLaurie of the laws for the upkeep of slaves. During this visit, the lawyer found no evidence of wrongdoing or mistreatment of slaves by LaLaurie. Although subsequent to the lawyer's visit, one of LaLaurie's neighbors had seen a 12-year-old slave girl fall to her death from the roof of the Royal Street Mansion while trying to avoid punishment from a whip-wielding LaLaurie. Two of such reports are on record as being true. One, that a man was so scared of punishment that he threw himself out of a third-story window, choosing to die rather than be subjected to Madame LaLaurie's torture. The other report, however, concerned the 12-year-old slave girl named Leah in the year 1833. Leah, it was said, 
was brushing Madame LaLaurie's hair and had unintentionally pulled a little too hard, causing LaLaurie to fly into a rage. The mistress had chased the little slave girl with a whip until the girl fell off the roof of the house and died. The incident had led to an investigation of the LaLauries, in which they were found guilty of illegal cruelty as Leah's body was discovered hidden in a well through the aid of some witnesses who had seen LaLaurie bury the girl's corpse. She was fined $300 by the authorities and forced to forfeit nine slaves of her household. These nine enslaved people were bought back by the LaLauries through an intermediary relative and returned to the Royal Street Mansion, where she continued to torture them until the night of the fire outbreak in the year 1834, 10th day of the month of April. Marie Delphine LaLaurie and her husband had fled by a boat, leaving the butler, who had also participated in the torture, to face the wrath of the crowd who had stormed into her mansion, charged by the insanity of her evil. Some historians have been compelled to think that perhaps the death of her family at the hands of slaves during the Haitian Rebellion had erupted the volcanic darkness within the woman somehow, which had taken hold of her personality. But that is no excuse for such outrageous evil. And although charges were never filed against LaLaurie, her reputation in the upper-class society was destroyed. It is believed that she died in Paris in December, 1842. Exploring the abuse of black male slaves by white women reveals an unsettling dimension of history that has often been overlooked or deliberately silenced. By confronting this painful reality, we challenge the conventional narratives surrounding slavery and deepen our understanding of the complex power dynamics at play. Acknowledging these historical injustices is an important step towards building a more inclusive and equitable future. So, what do you think generally about this? Kindly tell us what you think in the comment section. And stick around for an even more extensive content on the abuse of black male slaves in the antebellum era. It's been quite a thrill having you guys with us all the way in this video segment. Don't forget to encourage us by punching in that like button in front of you for sure, sharing your thoughts about the content, sharing with the share button as well, to the awareness of other associates and friends, and subscribe to stay with the channel. You are family. Thank you for being supportive. See you soon.